Hello everyone, my name is The Fox. This is Ambernick's latest handheld, their RG405M. Thank you very much to Ambernick for sending this out to me for review. If you were the type of person that liked Ambernick's RG353M, I would wager that the 405M would be right up your alley. This very well may be my favorite design from Ambernick, and I would wager that this is actually the best design that Ambernick has done. And I'll touch base more on that if you go into the build and specs chapter of this particular review. I'll touch base on a few of the things, but there are a lot of clever design decisions that Ambernick has decided with the 405M, and I'm on board with it. The other thing that I wanted to mention before we get too far into this review is that thankfully the Android Play Store is already embedded on this particular firmware, so you don't have to download that and inject it otherwise. So you can just go ahead and use Google's Play Store right from the get-go, which has thankfully been far easier for me to navigate around this. It's just something I just want to mention because I know that previous Ambernic devices didn't have that and you'd have to inject it later. So this is a course in the right direction that I just wanted to mention before we get too far into this review. Having said that, let's go ahead and get into the build and specs part of this review. All right, so in this particular part of the video, we're actually going to talk about the build and specs of the RG405M. And by and large, this is without a doubt the best design that Ambernick has done yet. And we're going to go over all the little detail finishes that I have seen that really make up the entirety of this particular device. So up first, let's take a look at this little alcove that they have here. So if we take a look at this little alcove for this button, this is something that I've been talking about that the RG351P had was these little alcove cut-ins just so that the entire device felt uniform and kind of level set and kind of distinctive with where they wanted to put things. If we take a look at the top, everything is nice and flush and just really well done. The other part here is that the back button has been combined with the home button. So you can see right here, if you press once, it will be back. And if you hold it, it would be the home button. Here we have the four inch 640 by 480 display. Inside we're looking at the Unisoc T618 chip, which is largely the dual core A75s at two gigahertz is what's largely gonna be driving a lot of the emulation here. We are backed up with the Mali G52 GPU and four gigs of LPDDR4X RAM. On board is 128 gigabytes of EMMC, which clocks at reasonable rates, both 2.4 gigahertz and 4 gigahertz Wi-Fi. And I'm gonna show you something that's really clever with the 405M that is a bit different than the 353M. We'll touch base on that in just a second. We do have Android 12. Now there are built-in controls and I'm gonna to touch base on the controls separately in this video. We have dual firing speakers on the bottom. We also have a spot for an SD card and the SD card read speeds that I'm getting out of here with an A1 card is around 50 megabytes a second read and write, a three and a half millimeter audio jack to complete it and wrap it up. Now the thing here that I also want to note is this little LED light, how it blocks light for the charging light. It just, the ambience of it is so much better than just a blaring LED. Just that little cover detail is pretty huge. Now the thing that I wanna show off really quick with regard to the build quality, if we take off the back cover of this device, it gets serious real fast. So we can see a whole bunch of RF shielding and a lot of other stuff going on here. Now, this just looks really immaculate. We have the little rumble motor here. We have the dual firing speakers. We have both analog sticks. Now, if we take a look at the analog sticks here, if we take a look at the back housing, we actually see that there is standoffs on the back side, so that if you push too hard on these analog sticks, they're actually going to be pressing up against this so that the analog sticks are not gonna break on through because what they're gonna have is a foundation that you're pressing against. But the thing that I was really curious about because when I was holding the RG405M, I was hitting this and I'm like, this is metal. How is the Wi-Fi working here? Because if we take a look at the RG353M, these sides, these are plastic and the Wi-Fi antenna is actually attached to this plastic side because it's not gonna be able to escape out of this metal shell. So they made the sides plastic for better reception for the radios on the Wi-Fi antennas. So what they've done here is pretty ingenious. You can see these two little pogo pins right here. And what that does is it presses up right against this antenna right here. So the antenna completes its connection right here. And then the Wi-Fi goes through this plastic rubber backing on the back. So the metal casing is no longer stopping the radiation. There is no interference. It's actually going through this pad right here, the right pad. That is a pretty ingenious thing. It was something that I was wondering that they were doing, and indeed it is. So kudos to Anbernick for that design decision, because now what they have managed to do is actually make a completely all metal case. There is no plastic side housing on this. 
And uh, it's really well done and pretty genius. And overall, looking at the inside of this, it does look rather handsome inside. So now here's the interesting part. Right here is actually where the battery sits. And initially I thought this was an exhaust port and there would be a fan here, but there doesn't look to be anything here. But what's interesting is, is that they have effectively a heat spreader for the battery itself. And then this gets output to the case itself. Now, the one thing that we have to talk about, if we're talking about battery life first, right? If we look at this device from a battery life perspective, if we are pushing this device as hard as it possibly can go with like PS2 emulation, we're looking at around four and a half hours of battery life. However, if we were to look at something that wasn't as taxing like PlayStation 1 emulation, we get around eight and a half hours of battery life. Now that's really substantial. So you're looking at anywhere from four and a half hours to about 10 hours of battery life, depending on what you're gonna do. Standby time is also really fantastic. I had it going for about 24 hours and only noticed a percent knocked off. So that's really good standby time as well. Now, the one thing that I would note here is this all aluminum shell that they have going for the RG405M is that if you're going to be pushing this device as hard as you possibly can with say PS2 emulation, you're most likely going to start feeling the warmth escaping and spreading through the aluminum shell. That heat spreader that they put over the battery is also spreading out to the aluminum shell as well. And that kind of radiates all outward. It comes out to the side of the palm over over here uh the right side of the palm over here so that is the one thing that i kind of want to mention now it doesn't get blazingly hot but it does get indeed hotter than my hand now one caveat here that i want to mention is the thermal scans that you're seeing when you take a look at the celsius rating that is off by a few degrees it's actually a few degrees less than that the point of this thermal video isn't to show you accuracy from how hot it is the hottest point of my hand is still less warm than the device gets. So you will feel that warmth transferring out onto the outside shell to a degree. It doesn't get burning hot, but it does get warm. And that's probably the only thing that I would say is a negative of this particular metal casing. There is potential for that heat to spread out and thermally radiate to the outside casing and then go into your hands. All right, so now to talk about the inputs themselves. So for the most part, I think this is kind of a recurring theme that I understand why they're doing inline shoulders, but for the life of me, I would really just prefer if they did stack shoulders. Even if it just bumps it out a bit, I know it will interfere with the, the pocketability of the device because this is relatively thin, but I, I really just would much rather stack shoulders at this particular point in time, especially as we get further and further out into newer chipsets that will be able to emulate other games better, where we're really going to start really requiring L2 and R2 to be in the proper positioning. So outside of that, I don't really mind it. All of the face buttons are really, really nice. And this is typical of most all Ambernic devices. So they're really nice, crunchy membrane face buttons. Now, these analog sticks we're going to touch base on in just a moment. They're, it's a bit sensitive to my liking. For the D-pad on the Ambernic D-pad, uh, everything about this D-pad, it is a membrane-based D-pad, but it is really, really nice. It's very easy to hit the diagonals. It doesn't feel like it requires any significant amount of force to push in any particular direction. Overall, this is Ambernick's typical quality of their D-pad. I typically assign them a B plus rating. It's not the best D-pad I've ever had, but it is it is really good. It is, it's a very good D-pad. I, I don't think you're going to have any particular real issues with it, perhaps just the placement of it, but it is offset a bit to the analog stick, and especially with just this little bump that comes out here, it makes, makes your hand just push out a little bit more, makes it so that when you're thumbs position on the d-pad it's not entirely uncomfortable uh but it is analog dominant so this is interesting from ambernick's point of view because typically they've always been d-pad dominant mostly because most of the systems that they make are retro emulation based so that a lot of the games are going to be very d-pad centric fit and finish and the form factor of the controls they are to my preference however the analog sticks themselves are a bit sensitive. All right, so now the very first thing that we have to touch base on is these are hull base sensors. So you can see when I put a magnet here that it will activate the controller. 
but there is a fair degree of cardinal snapping on the analog sticks, which isn't a super big deal. It really isn't. But the problem is, is that you can see that I don't even have to push all the way for the stick to go all the way to the end of its offset, which is uh, unfortunate because it just makes it that you just have to push a little bit to go the entire way. So what winds up happening is that this overly sensitive analog stick, so you can see that uh, I can pretty much paint the entire area and I'm missing a whole bunch of fidelity even though these hull based analog sticks allow me to if I push really slowly I can paint this entire field so the hull based analog sticks even though I do like that it makes a full square so we have full one-to-one -one offsets on the entire spectrum here the problem is is that it's really just super sensitive and what's pretty interesting is that these analog sticks are operating much the same as the absolute analog sticks do and they are they mean like ostensibly they look very similar in design so if we can get closer to there they they're reasonably similar the thing is is that these analog sticks are just really really very sensitive not that that's a huge big deal because again for the most part most of the games that you're going to be playing on the RG405M are going to be using the D-pad and the D-pad is rather excellent so that's pretty much it for the wrap up of the buttons and the inputs overall I think it's fine for what you're going to be playing on here it's rather good I'm a big fan of the face buttons I'm a big fan of the D-pad I wish there were stack shoulders and the analogs just need to be not so sensitive here uh, if we could just get it so that like right here it's all the way to the end of the offset and i still have some more travel left in the analog stick so these need to be tuned up a little bit better uh, and i would almost wager that these uh particular analog sticks are made by the same manufacturer and whatever firmware is running these guys or how they're running they're just tuned up to be way too sensitive all right so here we are with xbox's game pass xCloud streaming so I am streaming this through Xbox's xCloud servers right now and I don't really need to take a whole bunch of time here to kind of go over everything I just want to show you that it does work it is as easy as it would be that you would expect it to be because this is just Android 12 so you just go ahead onto the Play Store that is already loaded on the device nothing that you need to do just sign into your account and get Game Pass and then sign into your Xbox xCloud Game Pass account and then you're off to the races the only part that is not working right now every other button works just fine it's just that l2 and r2 aren't registering at all so if for instance in forza horizon uh, or any racing game when you're going to be pressing r2 to drive so this is one thing that i hope that amberton can fix with their ota updates because right now playing on xcloud is not working with l2 and r2 so that's something that i just want to briefly mention in this review as well Alrighty, in this particular segment, we're going to be taking a look at some of the more high-end emulation that's possible on the RG405M. In this particular instance, we're going to be taking a look at PS2 emulation. We'll also take a look at GameCube emulation right after this. We are using Aether SX2. Now, I am using the fast defaults here, which you can go to if you go to App Settings, and you go over here to the three little dots, and then you go to Fast Defaults. Essentially, the fast defaults are going to make the emulator less accurate, but things will be a bit faster, but without totally breaking a lot of games. Now it needs to be said that the T618 chip that is on the RG405M really doesn't cut the mustard for most all games on PS2 emulation. However, there are a few games that are really good and run very well. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at Kingdom Hearts. I'm going to go ahead and jump into my load state just so we can see like a battle scene. So we'll go here and we will lock on. And for the most part, even in other scenes where I was in the regular overworld, it was still running reasonably well. Now, I'm sure that there are going to be some slowdowns for this game in particular segments, but so far the game has been running exceedingly smooth. Let's go ahead and take a look at another game real quick. Alright, so this is Neo Contra. Hell at me. Oh, Jesus, I didn't even see those guys. All right, so here's a game that really doesn't run very well at all. This is Dragon Ball Z Sparking Meteor. 
you can see that we're frame rate wise we're just it's pretty poor overall looks really cool and looks awesome on this particular screen but in reality this is a game that is not going to be super playable it's actually really impressive when you think of like ps2 games right like oh, there's a, a good amount of ps2 games that actually really look good even today but that's kind of what I wanted to really address here, that when you're taking a look at PS2 emulation, you really shouldn't expect the world here. There will be a number of games that run pretty well. There will be a number of 2D-based PS2 games that should run reasonably well. But for the most part, don't expect all, the entire library to run because you're going to have a bad time if you come in with those expectations. Let's go ahead and take a look at GameCube emulation. I am using the Vulkan backend here, and I am using Uber shaders, specifically the specialized default Uber shaders. And putting on a few of the enhancements that for like backend multi-threaded, which does eke out a little bit more performance than OpenGL overall, but still we're in a place where this is not a game where it's really super playable, even though it looks fantastic on the screen. And it's kind of a shame that we just don't have the horsepower here to run this. Let's take a look at some other GameCube games. All right, so here we're looking at Super Monkey Ball 2. Now, this is a game that I think kind of demonstrates, like, where we're actually looking. Now, Super Monkey Ball 2 isn't a very intense graphical game, but we are able, actually, to hit pretty good frame rates here. And this is a game that is really sensitive to needing smooth and consistent frame rates because you're going to find a place where, especially on the later stages, where you really need to uh, really finesse the controls to get into the goal that any particular lag or latency spike is going to be punishing, to say the least. So Super Monkey Ball 2 is a game that can definitely be played on GameCube. Let's go ahead and take a look at another. And here we have Mario Kart Double Dash. Now, the unfortunate bit here is that, I mean, in reality, that the Vulcan API that is available on the Mali G52 that is available on the T16 H chip really isn't the best. So this is where Snapdragon with its Vulcan API will have just better compatibility. And OpenGL ES on this particular chip is needed. Uh, OpenGL ES is needed on Mario Kart because with Vulkan, uh, there's just an overlay issue. So switching over to OpenGL is kind of necessary here. And you can see that we're hovering around 50 FPS. So what would be recommended is to run the PAL version of this game and run that at 50 hertz. And that would overall be the better situation. So you could arguably play more GameCube games, but the types of games that you should be using, the ROMs that you should be using for GameCube, should be the PAL-based versions, and then when presented with the option, to run it at 50Hz mode. So this is really, like, more or less the extent of the upper end of emulation that'll be possible on the RG405M. For the most part, everything below this will work just fine. The only exception would be uh, a very accurate Sega Saturn emulation. With very accurate Sega Saturn emulation, we are very CPU bound there, and we will need something that is just has a little bit more oomph to get us across the finish line. However, uh, Yabashenshiro will run most games just fine. This is just going to be for a few games that actually need that highly accurate Sega Saturn emulator, like the Beetle Saturn emulator. This is in the instance of Dragon Force 2. So that's it for the high-end emulation. I covered previous emulation before this. We'll take a look at Android games next, and then we'll wrap this all up. All right, so in this particular section, I'm going to be showing off the new Doom game that just came out just recently. Now, the one thing to make note of for this game is that it is a portrait-based game. The other part that's pretty interesting is that the left analog stick actually would control my character, but it was oriented in such a way that it would have been for landscape, so up and down would work, but you know the character would be going this way, up and down that way, which is not very helpful. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've activated the built-in touch mapping control software that you can find right there, so you can see the little key mapper. And what that does is it's going to allow you to correspond to any of these controls to basically virtually touch the screen. So in this instance, I've mapped the right analog stick to this particular portion right here. So you can see that I'm actually moving the character around now that I have assigned the analog stick to this. So we can go ahead and close this out and use this as it is. And then at this point, you can play the game in Tate mode like you wanted to but using real controls instead of the on-screen controls. Now you can still obviously just use your own thumb on the touchscreen as well, but if you wanted to make use of something like that is better controls, you have that feature and functionality with the RG405M. Technically this is on all of Ambernix Android-based devices, so this isn't anything new or 
exotic in any particular way, but it just works as it should. So I just want to kind of report that in case anyone was interested or wasn't aware that Ambernix Android devices supported this feature. So as we can see here in Minecraft, as we use the controls, all of the on-screen controls go away and pretty much everything just works as you would expect it to. So now even though this is B-A-Y-X, what I have gone ahead and done is switched over to the Xbox mode. So if you go over to Nintendo Switch mode, which basically is, you know, the Japanese style, you'd press A to jump. So this way it would make more sense for you to use it as like an Xbox controller. And just so you see, if I touch the screen, you get all the on-screen stuff that gets in the way. But thankfully, as soon as you enable the controller, that all goes away and it's nice and clean. Pretty cool. So that's going to wrap it up for my review on Ambernix RG405M. By and large, I think this is Ambernix's best design. I'm hoping that there could be some over-the-air updates that can improve some things, much like the L2 and R2 within Game Pass not being registered at all. So hopefully that can be fixed later on. Additionally, I really hope that these analog sticks can be tuned up a little so that they're not as sensitive. But outside of that, pretty much everything I am on board with. Yeah, the device gets a little hot if you push it really hard, but it also gets exceedingly good battery life and excellent standby time. And with the larger 4x3 screen, the 4-inch version versus the 353M's 3.5-inch version, overall, I would very much recommend this with its T618 chip. So this seems to be... A a really well-packaged system overall, something that I prefer over the 353M myself. Those are my particular feelings. Let me know in the comment section what you guys think. As always, guys, thank you for your time, and thanks for watching.